In the 2023 Australian Honours List, Professor David Henscher was awarded a member of the Order of Australia. We could spend all day just listing his achievements, the papers and books he has written, the presentations he's made, the committees and other institutes that he has contributed to, let alone founding and managing for over 30 years the Institute of Transport and Logistics Studies at Sydney University. But he's the sort of person who is most comfortable, I believe, in having an open-ended conversation about the principles that are essential for an effective workplace, the need to understand the community, processes to discover creative ideas, and most importantly, the path to practical applications from research work. His passion and ethics are such a foundation for his work, there was no need for him to prepare for this unscripted chat. David, congratulations on your Order of Australia. Thank you, David. I much appreciate that. I heard that the people who nominated you and supported that were a broad reflection of very senior and important people, an, an eclectic group. That's a nice reflection on the work you do. It's absolutely nice. And it's, it's, it ranges from people in government, very senior people, including politicians. In fact, one was an ex-premier. Uh, together with my colleagues at the university and and also some people from a number of the key prestigious associations in our field of transport and logistics. So it's not just a a passionate but cloistered area, it is, as I say, a a very eclectic group. Indeed, indeed. In fact, although I'm not privy to the details, I do know that it's a lot of work to actually put the case. It takes up to two years. So um, um, it was a great great surprise and and a great honour. Transport planning, traffic engineering, started very much from the uh, engineering faculties. Perhaps they then engaged a bit with planning and moved a little bit to the environmental sciences. You are in the University of Sydney Business School. Yeah. Why? Was that opportune? Was that choice? Well, my formal education is in economics and econometrics. And, and, and my involvement with transportation was like many people, I just fell into it by being told that it's an interesting area to apply economics, especially microeconomics. And my mentor in particular, the late Professor Michael Beasley uh, from the London Business School told me that what it's a great area to apply economics. And that's what got me interested. Um, prior to that, um, I had anticipated and was moving to a career in development economics and monetary economics, primarily because <clears throat> although I was born in England, I was brought up in Kenya, East Africa, and um, it was always a passion to study um, the, the uh, economics of developing economies. But things changed when I got exposed to the interesting problems in transportation, which of course has been my career now for over 50 years. The business school, did they, what was their take? What was their expectation from you? Did, was it an easy step in? Well, it's a very interesting issue, that one, because it all started off in a mainstream economics department. And um, I, I did struggle a lot with getting the recognition that I thought the discipline deserved. Um, and I had built up a very successful centre, um, which is before Sydney, um, where I suffered from a lot of if you like jealousy, for want of a better word, I prefer not to say where, because it was so successful. And I thought, well, uh, at the time I'd met some professors at Sydney University in what was then the Graduate School of Business. The Sydney Business School did not exist at that time. It, that was the Faculty of Economics. And I spent more time over here actually in Barron Street, and it was suggested that maybe you want to move here because people like me. And so they created a position for me. It was interesting, that first position was the director of the Management Research Centre. Nothing to do with transport. I thought I'd had enough of that other than my research and was going to teach in the MBA, which I did. But it wasn't long after that when the then um, Deputy uh, Premier, um, Bruce Baird, who was the Minister of Transport in New South Wales, decided that the Transport Modelling and Data Collection Group in the Ministry of Transport would be better suited to a university. And I knew Bruce and he said, well, how about you take it over, write us a proposal. So we did. And my then dean, Murray Wells, got all excited about the possibility of having that in the business school. And um, it didn't happen for a couple of reasons. One is the union of the Roads and Traffic Authority said it had to stay in government. 
of which the people who were opposed to it moving uh, are great friends of mine now. <laughs> um, and um, it, it, it didn't happen. As a result of that, the uh, dean said, well, why don't we go ahead and do something anyway, since you've done all that work? And so I proposed to set up an Institute of Transport Studies along the lines of the name of the one in California, Berkeley, Irvine. I'd been at Irvine for a little while and also in, in Britain in ITS Leeds, although I'd spent my time at the TSU at Oxford. And, and, and Murray Wells, bless him, said, too ambitious, um, you've you got to call it a centre. And I said, um, and that I created the name of being a bit of a maverick back in those days, I want to call it an institute. And I, I won that case. So we decided to have an Institute of Transport Studies, which I decided to register. This is quite an interesting story because it turned out that this university never registered any names, including the name of the university. And so I, na I registered it, which was deemed to be unusual in both Victoria and New South Wales. And then that was 1990. And I had three staff veterans at the time, we called them now. Anyway, I am um, in three or four years time we actually um, were able to be successful in setting up an ARC Centre of Excellence called a Centre of Key Teaching and Research. And we brought Monash into the, into the mould. There was one dean though that did say, you know, he, he did have to stick his neck out. That is Murray Wells actually. He mm. said, he said, um, well, um, it was, I took a risk on you, David, but it worked. <laughs> uh, and um, so, and we slowly built up the reputation when we became recognised as a key centre of excellence. The first one, by the way, in transportation in Australia from the ARC. See, transport's often very much a, a grandeur. It's often very supply side, you know, trains and, and so on, with a vision to that. Uh, there is a notion of working towards customers, but that still tends to be once you're on the, mo the mode of transport. Yeah. The, the whole thing of business gives us an opportunity for value for money. We don't, we don't get into that enough, do you think? Well, I, I agree, but I, I, in the, the transportation and logistics discipline, if you like, has grown and matured to recognise that the customer matters. And I suppose this is where economists and psychologists compare with engineers who often become converted to understanding human behavior have really focused much more on the understanding as to how people make choices, mm. how those choices can provide Im important input into prioritizing investment in various forms of infrastructure and transport services, be they freight or, or passenger. It mustn't forget the freight side as well, of course. And so this has become almost a staple diet for ITLS. We changed our name from ITS to ITLS when we introduced logistics programs some years ago. And I think the reputation that we built up, and it was a good way to move, was to hire people that have a strong expertise in, um, in understanding choice and consumer behavior. The value of linking to business and other things, one of the award winners at your award night the other day had done work in medical research, went to do a Bachelor of Commerce, but got most of her uh, courses through your institute. That's a lovely link there, isn't it, that gives us a benefit from diverse areas. Yes. You know, one thing that I think is really great about a transport logistics supply chain, it is very much, in my view, a postgraduate area. And people come into our program with backgrounds at the undergraduate level in economics, engineering, mathematics, planning, sociology, and so on. And they see a really interesting application of their skills in an area that matters to society. And so the diversity of skill sets that people bring into the field enriches it, and mm. we're, we're the better for it. In fact, that gives you a springboard into evolving issues, like health is uh, an evolving issue in transport, which years ago was seen very strongly in terms of travel time and travel costs. Still important, but there's other factors. Yeah. Well, of course, safety has been there for quite a while, and that's mm. a health issue, of course. Mm. And in fact, today, it's even more important with the, that sad activity of the bus crash. But but, but health is broader than simply safety on the roads and so on. It's also to do with healthy lifestyle and um, the extent to which uh, people who move to active travel, are, um, they're better off in terms of their well-being. So happiness and well-being has now entered into the language of the transportation planners who are now arguing that from, 
that sustainability, which is the big buzzword these days, is broader than simply reducing emissions. It includes all the aspects of uh, well-being and happiness, which is a sustainability benefit to society. Because if you look at it in the broader sense of uh, reducing health costs, it has a benefit to other sectors. It could involve in doctors, you know, take no tablets, but walk to the bus in the morning. So, you know, the type of notion of involving other Absolutely. Professions. And, you know, although I, I often talk about the unintended positive consequences of COVID, and there were some downsides as well, it actually did create a change in attitude to walking and cycling. Uh, and one of our challenges is to maintain that as we move into the new normal, whatever that's going to look like. I want to take that just finally on that management side. It's not just having a grand plan. You taught and you're very uh, uh, proud of uh, teaching how to write a, a, a proposal. And I think that has brought great benefits both to your former student and uh, he's now support to the, your institute. Absolutely. I mean, um, um, my view of academia through ITLS is, is that if we're not maintaining relevance in society, we're not relevant. So what I mean by that is to engage with industry and government and to show by action that we're able to um, develop uh, tools and communication mechanisms that en enable others to benefit from what we do. It's one thing to write a wonderful academic paper and get it in a top journal. It's another thing to make it have impact. And I think this is the challenge for academia and part of a criticism of what counts and what should count. Writing a proposal can be full of weasel words or it can be a good reflection on how you're going to go about doing it. And I think, you're, if I may mention, your Neil Smith, was it, that uh, has now come back. Uh, he, he's successful overseas and, and here in running buses? Absolutely. Neil, Neil was a, he did the Master of Transport Management and he's um, one of our most successful alumni who, who has now bus businesses in, in Perth through Swan Transit, in Adelaide through Torrens Transit. He has three of the 12 regions in Sydney and he runs buses in uh, Singapore. He has big contracts. And recently he bought a major coach business in the USA. So, and in fact, I had lunch with him today. <laughs> He's out checking some of his businesses. And um, he, he, as a result of his involvement with us as well, through our Threadbow conference series, which I'm happy to mention if you like, he now is invited to give lectures at MIT. And he told me an interesting story today, which I think is absolutely true. By giving lectures at MIT, even though he's not an academic, it's opened up doors to industry in the USA. Isn't that fascinating? Yes, that's part of the diversity. Absolutely. Yeah. And people now, in, even in Australia, we, we are a global brand. We are one of the th only groups in the university that's allowed to also call ourselves beyond simply the University of Sydney. And we can, we can say ITLS as part of the university, mm. as part of the business school, and be very proud of that relationship. And that actually opens doors as well. Uh, doors that aren't just fulfilling um, obligations of presenting or that, but are, are, are pushing towards real solutions. Absolutely, we want to make a difference. And in fact, when Neil Smith funded uh, eight, eight, almost $8 million for a, a chair in sustainable transport futures and the, a lectureship in mobility and accessibility, the whole objective is to try through um, objective and critical thinking to make a difference on the um, policy settings that government and others um, put in place. And I think we heavily do we really need that today because there's a lot of confusion out there about things like decarbonisation, net zero emissions and so on as to how best to tackle that and basically what's the transition plan to get there. Things are changing very fast in technology and we need to be uh, totally abreast of that. And this is where universities can play a big role in, if you like, synthesising and suggesting where the future might be. Providing insights, not just conclusions, is that...? Absolutely. I mean, we, we like to put positions that we think have a chance of succeeding in an appropriate positive way, given whatever key performance indicators matter to those who wish to achieve the outcomes. And I think our role in some ways is to keep people honest, but in other ways, to inform them so that their honesty is reflected in their decisions. I think one of the deputy premiers who was very supportive of you starting a chair in public transport reflected that. Absolutely. Uh, this is in the days of the deputy premier in New South Wales, John Watkins, who was also Minister of Transport. 
and by knowing him and, and talking to him about uh, the way in which we could contribute, it all started from a conversation about his frustration with uh, what was being said in the media about transport policies and planning, and he felt that much of it was misinformed, misjudged, and we needed an objective view, and he thought academia was the best source. And so we sat down and decided, with the Director General of Transport at the time as well, to give credit to, to government bureaucrats, that why don't we set up a chair in public transport at the University of Sydney? And we did, and it's now 17 years on and still happening. The university, uh, I think, in Washington and that has talked about, you know, uh, informed democracy and getting that sort of information out. It's not just a conclusion at the end. It's an engagement in the discussion and the process with good, proper information. Absolutely. In fact, it's a, it's a forever process. There is no such thing as a conclusion and a full stop. Hmm. You move on to continue reinforcing. So at the moment, for example, uh, I am still promoting uh, better ways to reprice the roads and we've been saying that for years and despite politicians rejecting a lot of that with the unfortunate um, misnomer of calling it a congestion tax which is terrible language we need to find a different mechanism by which those who use the roads can get a benefit and those who have to pay for the roads get a benefit and you don't do this by um, going out and talking about nasty language like let's introduce a congestion tax, but rather let's look at ways in which we can redefine the prices of using roads in order for people to be financially no worse off. I remember then you, you did that sort of work that just said, hang on, this is the sort of order of magnitude that a, a, a shifting of tax, not a new tax, yeah. a shifting of tax, five cents in the peak hour per kilometre, that sort of thing? Yeah, that's absolutely right. In fact, we don't use the word tax. We talk hmm. about a, um, uh, a charge, and it's a subtle point for an economist. But, uh, no, no, um, no, absolutely. Um, but five, w w we did a lot of analysis to show for Sydney that if you had a five cents per kilometre uh, in the peak for all car use, we're talking about cars, not trucks here, and that we halved the registration charges, but in the peaks there was no five cents a kilometre. That's called a distance-based charge. So in other words, half the registration five cents a kilometre in the peak, nearly every driver would be financially better off, nobody would be worse off. Now, peak kilometres are typically on average, and one has to be careful about averages, is 4,000 kilometres. 4,000 kilometres at five cents is $200. You can save halving a registration $200 or more, so you're better off. And what's important about this, it reduces the traffic in the peak between six and 10, 10%. And what's also important about that is saying, what does that mean? Well, it means returning to school holiday traffic levels. And when I made that comment, being interviewed some years ago by Channel 9, they jumped on that and said, that's what we need to tell everybody. It's clever use of proper uh, language in terms of communicating it. Uh, po politicians run from it because of the word yeah. tax. I think the thing that we're good at, we're good at the economic theory and the modelling, but we're also good at translating it into language that can make a difference. I, I call that buy-in language. Mm. And it's not manipulation. No. It's information. It is. See, a lot of um, transport and that has been sort of a supply side, yes. as we talked about, it's been very grand, you know, build, you know, if we can have a politician cut a ribbon and that, you know, we, we've, we're being seen to do something, but it's mm. not necessarily the right thing to do. You have a caution of the use of the word project. I do. In fact, um, generally speaking, big infrastructure is called a project. And the general view is without thinking about service levels and pricing, you can't you can't necessarily solve problems by simply building more of an asset, which then gets back to like a high level of congestion. Um, also, I, the reason why I don't like the project big word is because it implies a, a large entity that's physical and you build it when in fact the word initiative is better because there are so many initiatives that are to do with improving service levels, changing the pricing model, providing incentives for particular types of activities that people do, in changing frequencies of services, informing people better about their options. These are initiatives and sometimes you can change travel behaviour more effectively by informing them of those initiatives than simply building something. Of course, building something is very, very expensive. But also, when you get into the word project, 
It's often the case that governments limit the number of projects that need to be evaluated, mainly because they've already decided what they want. And one of the best examples I can share with you, which I, in in sense, can say that um, the ex, an ex-premier, Bob Carr, who loved what I said and started putting it into a blog, he's a big blogger, said, I, he and I are up at Parliament House some years ago, and we were asked to talk about transport projects. And I was actually t- asked to talk about road pricing. But when I got there, the chair said, no, you're not allowed to talk about that. <laughs> Find another topic. So I thought, oh, well, I'll talk about public transport. And so I, I, I said, and it's interesting because the Greens are in the front row, and I knew they weren't going to like what I was going to say. I said, the Northwest Rail Project, the Metro, which is a pretty good service today, but $13 billion, it did come in slightly under budget, which is great. If you'd spent that $13 billion beyond a single corridor by actually quadrupling the bus services throughout the whole of Sydney, and that's what it would have cost, and don't tell me there aren't enough buses because you can import them within two weeks, this is pre-COVID, from China, made under license from Mercedes and BMW, all the good operators with high standards of quality. You can bring them in and quadruple the bus services. In other words, higher frequency, more coverage. And if you can't change car use into public transport in a significant way by doing that, you've got no hope of doing it by simply building the odd corridor of a railway. And the Greens didn't like it because they said this would cause huge congestion on the roads. I said, with the greatest respect, if you quadruple the bus services and you don't get sufficient people out of cars, you've got no hope in getting them out of cars through any public transport solution that government is supporting. And I still believe in that. Mm. I think the bus is much uh, regarded as a negative form of transportation compared with the train. But what we do need to do is to have corridors for buses. Yes. A which bus, is the same as having a corridor for a train. One's called a rail track yes. and the other's called a road. And even if the bus corridor, bus rapid transit, doesn't carry quite as much as the train, you can probably build two corridors serving two different areas yeah. you know, for the same money. But you can actually carry as many people, but even though yes. you yes. can't get as many into one um, carriage, The service capacity can be as good as the train capacity in terms of service, but not necessarily in terms of vehicle capacity. So you can you can just have higher frequency service, you know, although uh, it can be done both ways. We don't measure area wide projects nearly. And and a lot of data is collected for simple one off single corridor type projects. It's a limitation in our thinking. It is. But even if we allow for system wide impacts, they're generally not very good beyond a certain distance from the uh, the service level. So we need to start off with policies, initiatives that could have a broader system-wide impact. And for example, in- increasing the amount of bus services everywhere, as I've given as an example. Um, there's nothing stopping us from doing that, but this is in, there's almost an emotional ideology that buses are boring mm. and trains are sexy. I once had an argument with them when they were putting the light rail to Parramatta saying by the time it's built, uh, we would have autonomous buses that could run down that corridor. And the person who was promoting it, who was from marketing, said, oh, I don't want buses, which I thought, well, maybe you need to change your artist's impression because a good bus down a corridor can look just as sexy as... Absolutely, and that's why now we're called the Good Ones Trackless Trams, <laughs> and they look like light rail, mm. uh, and and they're on they're rubber tired, they're they're on they can be on a guided road if you like. They're less as expensive to build than railways, and they can carry as many people. And I know in Perth they're seriously close to actually doing a trial. And so Peter Newman, who's who is a been very much a supporter of light rail historically and against me on BRT, mm. has become quite a fan of trackless trams, which um, once again, um, the reason why it's called a trackless tram is because we wanted to get rid of the word bus because it's emotionally not appetizing. Make buses sexy ought to be our policy. And that includes electrifying them because the noise and the pollution is a detriment. And well, it is. I mean, I mean, that's another point we should say that too much of the debate on decarbonisation in transport all to do with zero emissions at the tailpipe. We don't account for things like the whole 
life cycle of manufacturing, um, even of batteries and so on, where there's more emissions mm. produced from electric vehicle manufacture cars than there is from uh, diesel or ICEs. But also more importantly, um, uh, there's huge amount of CO2 produced by braking and rubber, rubber hits the road for buses and cars, which, is, which means they aren't zero emissions. There, there might be zero coming out of the tailpipe, that there's plenty of emissions still being generated. Mm. And some of that stuff, by the way, m- morphs into local air pollution, which is also a nasty beast. And my real worry, and we're yes. doing, this is where we're trying to change the agenda. The climate change agenda is all about CO2. But in fact, local air pollutants are often more dangerous to one's health. Than, than CO2 ever is. In uh, discussing and being interviewed on you know, conservative radio, I avoid saying climate change and talk about local pollution because the level of asthma in children is a measure that a lot of people can understand yeah. rather than necessarily a broader, although important, I believe. Yeah, well, you yeah. don't, my understanding is you don't get asthma from CO2 emissions, you get it from other pollutants. Yes. PM2s are a particularly concerning one mm. because of the carcinogenic nature of them that get down your windpipes and they can cause cancer. And you, So we've done a lot of work to reduce local air pollution, but we mustn't forget that it's still an issue. One of the comments uh, that was in the abstract from one of your books, I think, was although the theory is relative clear, and here we're talking about understanding customers, yeah. uh, estimation and data issues are far from clear. That we do, we need to have a better understanding. We measure a lot of what people are doing, how they and how they're travelling. Household surveys gives us a chance of why they're travelling. An important issue. Absolutely, it's 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 all about understanding behaviour. But not just understanding behavior today, but understanding how people might respond to new circumstances in the future. And so your data should be rich in what I call the analysis should be consistent with the unit of the decision maker. And this is where, say, aggregate zonal data is problematic because that assumes an average person traveling between an O and D, which doesn't exist. So it's all a matter of explaining variance, not not explaining means. And this means that we need richer data. And I have to say, the combination of stated preference methods, which are based on looking at new futures, new alternatives, and seeing how people might respond to them, combined with pivoting around what people have currently experienced, is a very rich set of data to understand how the future might look like when we introduce change. So the other thing that's very important, and I gave a lecture last night, to Scotland, actually, into Scotland, to a health economics group. So here's the health thing coming again. And they, because I have done a lot of work on how you build risk into into choice models and how you identify the rules that underlie how people make choices, they they asked me to give them a talk because I'm pretty much a world leader in that space. And most of the transport modeling that we do assumes everybody's risk neutral. When in fact they're not. Some people are risk takers, some are risk averse. And so we must recognize that if we don't account for the way in which people view futures and process it in terms of whether it is going to be one that's going to create an interest to them in terms of the risk exposure levels or not, then chances are you'll you'll impose a conservative assumption in your models as if they don't process things like that and they just work off a process neutral response. This is really important because this brings psychology and sociology and economics together into the application of understanding consumers with marketing, of course. If you ask people of what are the parameters they want in buying a car, but most will tick safety up high. But I think your stated preference might say, are you prepared to pay this amount for safety? And that's a different question altogether. Very important because you're now bringing into the area of of discrete choice modeling one of the great appeals of it is not necessarily in forecasting demand but also calculating what's called the willingness to pay how much people are willing willing to pay for certain levels of certain attributes that are offered in a product or a service and of which of course in transportation the classic is the value of travel time savings which has become rather a dominant measure of the user benefit Uh, but we've added in recent years the value of travel time variability because of congestion and we've also added in the value of risk reduction through um, um, being exposed to degrees of serious injury or fatalities on the roads. And we've even added in crowding, 
on public transport, how much people are willing to pay to avoid it pre-COVID, mainly on my that. And now we're starting to build in attributes like the extent to which if you choose a more sustainable mode of transport, there might be some benefits in terms of happiness and well-being and fitness. Now, if, you're, if, if you want to put that in a cost-benefit analysis, the sad state of affairs is you've got to put a dollar value on it. Otherwise, sadly, it doesn't get a, it doesn't get a reckoning. And then you end up getting in the dominance of the values of travel time savings and things like that. But the answering one to five, you know, most people answer four, as I say, um, the great trouble with that is that often leads to quoting a statistic to three decimal places, whereas what you're getting is almost nuance and, and, and an idea of some of the factors that may not be definitively defined, defined, but may be important to try and understand in developing a policy. Absolutely. In fact, you know, opinions and attitudes are very important attributes that condition people's um, um, views on, on what they do and how they might respond to futures. So increasingly, we're finding that what someone believes or what someone would like to see happen could have a bigger impact on where priorities and policy should go, knowing that in the future, that might be something that they would support. Whereas if you observe what they've done in the past only, it could be quite misleading. And especially if, if you observe what they've done in the past pre-COVID and assume that that will be reflected in their future circumstance. In fact, today we were talking about why is it that many governments assume that 2019 is their baseline at which they calibrate the existence of the world on and everything that happens since COVID has got to be an adjustment around 2019. Absolute rubbish. Well, that you had a panel discussion and uh, including a uh, representative from the UK where they stopped measuring things during COVID in most cases. And his, his answer to that was, uh, I think the academic point, well, that's absolutely ludicrous because it stops us understanding a social uh, change. Yeah, couldn't agree more. And we've been very privileged and I think we're smart. We decided on March 2020 that there was an important monitoring exercise required because we didn't quite know what was going to happen. We didn't realize the severity of lockdowns, but we had twigged that there was going to be an encouragement to work from home more and more. So we started doing surveys. We were, we had some sponsorship, I must admit, and thank you TMR in Queensland and Transport for New South Wales through the iMove CRC, which is a wonderful research supporting mechanism with industry and government. We, we, we basically developed um, some new analytical methods to adjust these traditional strategic travel models to recognize what impact working from home would have on um, the amount of travel on the network, not just the reduction in commuting, which on average was saving eight hours a week, but also how much of that saved time was being reallocated of which half to work at home. So there was a productivity gain. We didn't do it before COVID to that extent. And also some of it being translated into leisure activities in and out of the home, including some non non commuting trips, including more walking, more cycling. So, you know, had we not bothered to start collecting data to understand what was going on, we would have not been able to really understand the extent of these changes and integrate them into the existing tools that government's using to forecast. And to, to this very day, we are continuing through TMR and Transport for New South Wales to help them to refine their strategic models to see what impact working from homes having on forecasts of traffic on the road network and on public transport. You made a point about walk, working from home of it's not all or nothing. And, and equally, it's not exactly what it is now. We can refine yeah. how that works and goes on. That's the important point about being open to ad, ad, adapting and, and, and to the real world yeah. and the, the ultimate benefit to the community. Absolutely. We, by the way, we need, we need analytical tools that can quickly get current data and quickly re-estimate and reapply. And, and one of the real problems with some of the old, older tools, um, which often are consultants hired to run for government, is that they um, are such a beast to recalibrate or they don't have current data and they can only do a limited number of, number of traffic assignment runs because it's too expensive. The client says you can only do four. When what we're doing with Metroscan, which we've developed, mm -hmm. fortunately using the university's high speed computers, we can turn around an infinite number of possible um, assessments of initiatives and projects, if you like, um, 
very quickly to narrow down on the ones that might have value for money. And the trouble is with the existing frameworks in which many transport planners work, they have a very narrow vista of things they're told to evaluate. And the ones that matter may be out, out of scope. I know the point about modelling is too how the information will be used. Yeah. That we, before we even get into huge technology, and I love your, your program, I'll talk about that. But the real question first and foremost is who's using it and how? And in many ways it's being used to justify a preconceived idea and even manipulated to justify yeah. a preconceived idea. That must be disappointing from looking for the value for money. It's, it's very disappointing, but I think it comes down to a whole, a whole history of possibly lack of the right skill set uh, in government that understands the value of um, the more, the more advanced methods that can better inform. But also those who do the research, be they academics or consultants, need to understand how to translate it and communicate it to their clients in a way that makes it particularly useful so that both parties can debate and question. I have to say, I often see too much one way interpretation and the other party takes it or leaves it. Mm. And if it's too complicated, they ignore it. No, they'll leave it, no, but, do. but that gets back to your program then that you say you can give an answer in 40 minutes, which is indicative, And yeah. but could that not be a much more value part of an assessment, a community involvement yeah. assessment, instead of having just a bit of show and tell to yeah. say, what do you think you might like? Well, we'll go and test that Absolutely. and come back to you. Yeah, I, I think that's really important. Um, generating the set of initiatives to test is so critical to knowing what may well be uh, the um, appealing uh, investment options or, or service change options that could make a real difference. And you need to also test them by getting community engagement with whatever you're doing. It's just not a matter of saying that, you know, that um, we, we think there's a really good case to um, change this service to a particular level without being, even though the model might say that has real prospects of growing patronage, you know, sometimes you really got to test it in real markets because models are indicative only. Mm. Um, I think they, they're a useful supplementary tool to inform you about possibilities, but you shouldn't believe them to the extent that they're right. Well, that's getting away from predicting the future to uh, assessing possibilities. Yeah, I think one of the greatest challenges in forecasting is not necessarily the um, all the fancy parameters and all, all the underlying endogenous effects in the models, but it's all those external forecasts, forecasting land use changes, forecasting population. They're often where the big sources in forecast are, and that stuff's external to the model because it's an input and it's not an output. And it's not often, you know, 10 or 20% accurate. It can, no. vary, it can vary enormously. Some of our work on toll roads, uh, when we've been advising, have shown that when you do a follow-up afterwards, that the reason why the forecasts are way out of whack is because what you were told to assume about population and employment growth and land use is not what's happened. And that's why the forecasts are not aligned with uh, reality. It also maybe can give a, a, a community a sense of value for money. You might well be able to say, well, we could, I've seen community consultation, what do you want? I'd love a railway line. Okay, well, for the same price, we could do this. Yeah. And, and that, and, and you know, the reality is, yeah. you know, there's not going to be infinite money to do both. Yeah. Well, we've just completed an extensive study uh, with iMove and the Transport for New South Wales on rural and regional uh, towns and rural hinterlands, trying to understand their ac accessibility needs. And the first thing you do, you do a lot of in-depth interviews, you do some focus groups. You particularly in those areas want to identify the extent to which social exclusion is a result of inadequate transport. Uh, you want to understand what's currently offered and what, where it's working or not working. For example, community transport generally closes down on the weekend when people need it. Um, public transport is, is such a rigid, regular public transport, it doesn't serve the needs for most people. It's not door to door. Some people can't get to it. On demand buses are not a bad idea, but they, there's not many of them. But what is a great idea, and we've just come up with this proposal, which has generated a lot of interest in government, is what we call a community car club. Now, you might, you might then want to say to me, David, what is that? That is not right. That is not um, right car sharing here. or anything mm. like that. Think of the following: because 
regional towns have a strong community ethos. You, you develop a platform, a digital platform, where you invite people who need to go to places who are often disadvantaged in getting there because of inadequate transport. They may or may not own a car or they need to bring a carer with them, whatever. They register for free. Um, and then you get people who own a car who are quite happy as good citizens to make their car available with them as the driver when they're going somewhere. So they're doing the trip anyway. So they register. And the reason why we need the platform is we want to ch check for the car's safe, the driver's got rep is reputable, the people that want to trip are, are, are not, not dangerous people or whatever. Mm -hmm. So they've got to pass a certain test. Then what happens, the person who's that wants to go somewhere, registers that interest on the, on, on the platform. And then we, we, we put that out to the drivers and say, is anybody going there? And they might say, great, yes, but maybe an hour earlier or an hour later, I'm happy to take a person or two person. And then we ask for a donation. We don't have a price. This is not a, a regulated model. The donation is simply to thank the driver and to maintain uh, the cost of running the the platform and it typically would only be twenty dollars for example like mudgy to sydney uh, now we also need to do the matching for the return trip right also through through raising money through the um, platform we might use some of that to subsidize accommodation if the person can't get back in the same day as an incentive for joining now if you've got to have a doctor's appointment and you've got to go to Sydney, you might not be able to get back, but you can't afford accommodation that would be appropriate. This is a community centric model. And we have generated huge interest. My colleague, Professor John Nelson, mm -hmm. is going up to Mudgee next week to talk to them about it because they are excited. Now, isn't that a good example of research identifying a market for a new product? rather than saying, how can we improve public transport, yes. which is not going to make a difference enough to be regarded as value for money. I went to Mudgee and uh, they talked about the train being reinstated. It was six months ago. I said, how many trips, have, you know, how often? They've said there's been two trains. One was the minister to open it <laughs> and one was uh, subsequent to that. So, yeah. so there's high ideals. But you raise then latent demand. Now, you knew the people and I think may have even had some you know, involvement in the Fiji household survey. Yes. And the, at an ATRF conference where it was reported that a lot of people didn't travel, someone, I thought rather pretentiously, said, oh, well, then it's not a travel survey. Well, yes, it is for the very reason of understanding what they're doing at the moment, but what they might do in the future. Absolutely. I was involved in the uh, household travel survey, that which we did in Fiji. Mm -hmm. uh, we did two, actually, although I haven't done any more since. But what was interesting, Fiji is 350 islands. And so m some of these people, in order to get to market to sell their produce, had to um, uh, walk to the side of their island, then canoe across to another island where the boat is large enough for them to catch in order to go to the mainland where they're selling their produce and then walk to the market. And those people, um, as indeed others, were saying there must be a better way of doing this. We know this, this is a disincentive for us actually wanting to grow our produce into these markets because it's such a strain to get there. Canoe is not a standard uh, category in most surveys. Well, we had some fantastic, including uh, riding a horse. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think one journey to work was swimming too. Didn't uh, well, swim? maybe between uh, two places where yeah. they, why bother with a canoe, let's <laughs> swim. But it did, it did raise questions about the difficulty also of how you collect data in such remote communities. Yes, good. And uh, we had to sample very carefully across 350 islands and the politics were horrendous. We had to make sure we represented enough islands so that the various ministers were happy that this was a representative survey. Uh, at another time, I'd like to discuss just the complexity of trying to bring in something like mobility as a service and that. But let, let me talk about um, sure. then you've started things and worked in academia and that. I think it was Woodrow Wilson, uh, a great administrator and a professor, uh, and then uh, President, President of, Prince, of, of Princeton, yeah. uh, but uh, somewhat uh, his morality in terms of races is perhaps uh, was very questionable. But he said, 
in terms of being a, in academia and being the President of the United States, I would prefer the President of the United States, there's less politics. Look, I think that's, well, I'm not sure today with Trump, but there's certainly on the money, <laughs> the politics in, in universities are horrendous. Mm. And also, you know, it's, it's, and it, there's so many dimensions of it, it's very heterogeneous. And even if you're extremely successful, there's a lot of jealousy. I have to say, this has been a bit of a challenge, not now, thank God, in the past with the, the success of ITLS, where, you know, we, we have really exceeded in terms of our success in all sorts of areas, in terms of engagement with industry, in research funding, in publications. And we should be proud of that. And I know the new dean, she's wonderful, is very proud of that. And I think we're in, in good shape. But there have been times in the past where if a group is slightly more successful than the rest, then that's not fair. Well, well, the point is bring the rest up to there rather than drag you down, you know. And was it um, Samuel Johnson that said that the battles within academia are so intense because quite often they're about such small things? Yeah. You know, the, but you've been successful. I might say one thing about that, having been to your awards nights and that, you have a very clear, uh, everyone says they do it, but you have very clear, I think, demonstrable collegiate value to it. Yeah. Uh, if you look at some of the scientists in the past, they've had their bosses, you know, who've, who've tried to take credit. Faraday had, um, you know, uh, other people that tried to take over his particular thing, Humphrey Davy and that, mm. um, who still did some good work. Cassini, I think, still did some good work. But you, you really have a genuine way, and the people I've met of, uh, of are within that environment very strongly. Yeah, well, I think that's also why I've been keen. It's been now 33 years of running it since we started. And, you know, and people are extremely happy. And uh, I think, um, first of all, we, we said we don't believe in hierarchies. So they're, they're gone. We're all equal. Doesn't matter who you are. The PhDs are as much members of staff as others. And everybody gets respected. And there's no such thing as looking down. It's looking with and joining and discussing and having mutual respect. I think we've done a great job on that. And the other thing that the students love, we engage with them uh, as equals, you know, and you saw that at the awards night. Um, mm. and, and not only that, we have opened doors through our involvement with industry and government to create job opportunities for our students. And I think that's really, really important. It's a happy place. And you know what I don't want to hire is somebody that thinks that they're so good that they don't need to engage with anybody else. You can have some really smart individuals that's hide in the corner and do things, but we don't want them in ITLS. We want smart people that can work in teams and partner and open doors into industry and bring in funds and support others. And I always see with our, with our research staff who aren't full-time academics as such, that we want to give them careers. We don't want them to come and go according to the late, latest grant. Mm. So we've had some research analysts, senior research analysts with us for quite some time, and they move between projects according to what's the latest thing we need to look at. And I don't want to have to go out and find somebody else because the money was only for projects X and now this is project Y. That's really important. I, I got it totally wrong. Uh, John Nelson introduced me to someone and it was such an engaging conversation of, of involvement. Yes. I thought they were a professor of high order or something. Uh, it turns out uh, you know, they were, an under, you know, they were a, a postgraduate student. Uh, and you know, yeah. that's my mistake, yet I think that was a lovely reflection. Yeah. Well, you can see we invite the, all the PhDs uh, all the, and, all, and all the award. We can't invite all the master's students. There's too many of them because we pay for the whole thing. And with through a sponsor, of course, each year we've managed to get sponsors um, and, and they're blown away. They said, well, gee, we didn't realise how you care for us or how good it is, because most students will go through the university. They'll go and do their um, graduation ceremony, but they don't have that same level of interaction that that we've been offering, which I think is very special. And uh, a, a recent vice chancellor or and deputy vice chancellor and provost, Stephen Garton, who's since retired, when I say retired, he's still doing research. He, he's, he's quoted on a number of occasions that we need more ITLSs. If we had more ITLSs, he's talking about the research mix and so on, I wouldn't have so many financial headaches. That's the sort of fundamental principles and that that leads to creative 
ideas and but then practical applications and I think that's wonderful. Yeah well we, we have a mixed portfolio and I think that's important that's why we're not a research centre we're an institute of transport logistics studies because we do we do teaching graduate teaching coursework PhDs supervision we do a lot of industry related projects we run short courses and micro credentials and we do mainstream research and so there's this mixed portfolio so when it's raining in one and, and it's a desert in the other we continue on because we're not dependent on one source of income to survive. That's why research centres that are narrow, sadly, many of them come and go within a short period. Which is a wonderful example, David. I've enjoyed our conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. I've enjoyed it also. Take it slow, fill up our tank, try to forget yesterday.